day. Okay, can you all see my screen okay? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for joining. My name is Caroline Stivers, and I'm Operations Manager of Kentucky Commercialization Ventures, and will be hosting us today. The Kentucky Intellectual Property Alliance, or KIPA, is a program of the Kentucky Commercialization Ventures Initiative and KSTC. The mission of KIPA is to foster an effective ecosystem and marketplace to facilitate the creation, protection, and advancement of intellectual property in Kentucky by serving as a connecting organization for statewide companies, organizations, and innovators. If you're interested in learning more, you can find more information along with the form to join as a member for free on kyipa.org. Also wanna give a big thanks to all of our executive advisory committee that are on with us today. Um, they provided us with the connections to fill this great panel. So a big thank you to all of them. We also have some folks from the Ohio Intellectual Property Alliance on today. So um, I will hand it over to you if you want to introduce, introduce yourself and the Ohio IPA. Thank you, Caroline. Good morning, everyone. I am new, I'm part of the funding board from the Ohio IP Alliance. So we are essentially the sister organization to the Kentucky IP Alliance. We are a newly formed nonprofit organization with the same mission as the Kentucky IP Alliance, trying to foster an effective ecosystem and marketplace to facilitate the creation, protection, and enablement of intellectual property in the state of Ohio. So primarily, we have three focuses. One is the IP awareness and education. The second pillar is the IP ecosystem collaborations. Um, the third one is the IP diversity and inclusion. So we envision ourselves as the connecting hub that encourages innovations for the economic and social well-being um, of Ohio citizens. So we are also a funding chapter to the United States Intellectual Property Alliance. Um, we're very honored to be co-hosting this webinar with Kipa today, and thank you for having us. Thanks so much, Moon. It's great to have you all here with us today. So I am going to get us started with just a few housekeeping items. First, today's webinar is being recorded. We'll be emailing a link out for that to attendees and our members after we wrap up. Uh, second, we do have captions available for this webinar. Those can be turned on or off at the bottom of your Zoom window. We'll also have the transcription of the webinar available after we wrap up. If it's needed, send me an email at cstivers at kstc.com and I'll put that in the chat in just a minute. And lastly, as we are hosting in the webinar format, participants are all muted. So please place any questions or comments you have in the Q&A or chat area. If they've not been addressed by the end of the presentation, we'll make sure to answer them before we end our webinar today, or we'll connect with you afterwards. We can also uh, promote you to talk momentarily. So um, if you prefer to do that, just raise your hand and, and uh, we'll take that as, as the cue to do that. So. I am going to kick things off today by introducing our first speaker, Helen Henderson of Weathers and Rogers. Helen is a chartered UK patent attorney and a registered European patent attorney specializing in the life sciences field, where she works with technologies including biodiagnostics, cell biology, immunology, and neuroscience. A significant portion of Helen's practice focuses on the higher education sector. Having direct experience of academic research, Helen is well-placed to work with academics, TTOs, and startups to draft and file applications, manage IP portfolios, and develop IP strategies. Helen is also an active member of Autumn and Practices Oral. So Helen, I will hand it over to you to talk about changes coming in the European region. Thank you, Caroline. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm just going to give you a really quick um, introduction to the unitary patent system, which is going to be a big change coming to unitary pa uh, to European patents. Um, this is a huge topic um, and I don't have a lot of time today, so what I'm going to really try and focus on is what you need to know now and I'm going to go quite quickly. So feel free to follow up with me separately offline um, if you'd like to know more about any of the points that I'm skimming through today. Uh, next slide please. Um, so this is just a really quick introduction to my firm, Withers & Rogers LLP. Um, we're one of Europe's larger IP firms and we've got offices in France, Germany and the UK. So we can act as a single point of contact for work at the EPO, the EU IPO and the major national offices. Um, and as Caroline hinted, we do a lot of work with US and UK universities 
um, and I actually head up our higher education uh, sector team. So I'm really happy to be here and, and speaking with you today. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a really quick recap of the existing um, system with European patents. So as you know, you file a European patent application at the EPO, um, which is not an EU linked institution. So it actually covers about 38 countries rather than the EU 27 member states. Um, the EPO will handle search and examination. Hopefully you then get a um, notice of allowance or what we call a rule 71-3 communication. Um, and that lets us know that we need to then complete the steps for grant of the EPO patent. And then we have to do the national stage validations. So in other words, once the European patent's granted, it has to be validated in each of the 38 member states where the applicant wants it to take effect. And it becomes a bundle of national rights that have to be maintained and enforced separately. Next slide, please. So to start with the new package, um, it comes in two parts. The first is a European unitary patent. So that's going to be a new patent right arising from an EU initiative, meaning it can only cover EU member states. Um, so self-evidently, it won't cover non-EU countries, so like the UK, Norway, Switzerland or Turkey. Um, it's also going to come with the second part, which is the unitary patent court, uh, which will be the only court that will have jurisdiction for infringement or validity matters relating to unitary patents. Um, and eventually all patents granted by the EPO for unitary patent contracting states will be litigated at the UPC, um, regardless whether they're unitary patents or traditionally uh, validated bundles of um, European patent rights. But in the interim, there's going to be a transitional period uh, where traditionally validated European patents can opt out of the UPC jurisdiction for a period of at least seven years. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to give you a bit of context and a timeline, uh, where are we now? Well, for the system to come into force, we needed a few things to happen. You've probably been hearing about this for a number of years, but we're, we're finally getting there. Um, so on the 18th of January this year, Austria ratified the necessary legislation, and the final step is going to be for Germany to ratify. Um, German ratification is going to set a four month deadline for the whole system to go live. So Germany are deliberately holding off ratification until everything is within is sufficiently far advanced that it can go live within that four month window. Um, I actually have some inside information. So um, since I prepared this slide a few few months ago now, um, things have moved on. But the inside information is we are very firmly expecting German ratification to be happening on the 1st of December, which will give us a go live date of the 1st of March 2023. Um, so you heard it here first. Um, the the ratificate, German ratification will set off what we call the sunrise period, and that's a preliminary period of time for applicants to take steps to have their portfolios ready for the go live date. Next slide, please. Um, so a unitary patent will be a single patent right, which can cover most of the EU. As of go live, it's expected to cover the 17 countries listed here, and more EU member states will be are expected to ratify, so we're expecting Ireland, Romania and Greece to join very soon. Spain and Portugal have said they don't intend to join, but obviously that could change in the future. Um, with the new uh, system, if you want country, if you want patent protection in countries outside of this list, you can do a combination of a unitary patent and national stage validations in the countries that are outside the unitary patent system. Um, the unitary patent uh, will cover a market that stands of about 300 million people with a GDP of 13 trillion. Um, so it's a huge market and potentially a very valuable right. Um, and given the timeframes that we're talking about with the sunrise period starting um, hopefully by the end of this year, this is a really good time to start thinking about your important markets and whether a unitary patent route or traditional validations or a blended approach might be best um, for you. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a really quick visual of the protection available. In the left, we've got a traditional European patent with all the different countries in which you can validate using the extension states. In the middle in dark blue, we've got the unitary patent as it currently stands. And then on the right in pale blue is the unitary patent um, at, with potential coverage of 25 of the 27 EU states. Um, 
the key point is that coming out of the EPO grant process, you could still end up with multiple patent rights. So you could have a unitary patent uh, covering the contracting states and then other national stage validations covering countries which are outside of the unitary patent system. Um, thinking about the unitary patent itself, it's got some well-known pros and cons. So there's a vulnerability to central revocation on one hand, um, but you also have the ability to obtain multi-country damages and injunctions on the other. Um, and one of the other considerations uh, is obviously costs. Next slide, please. Uh, a key take home message um, and, and one that I've, I've seen presented in, in less than uh, clear ways in different places. It will be possible to license a unitary patent country by country, but it won't be possible to assign it country by country. It can only be assigned in its entirety. So something to think about given the long term nature of patents um, is what is the uh, exit strategy for the applicant? Are they likely to want to sell their patent before it expires? And if they're going to do that, would having a unitary patent be a good thing or a bad thing for them? Next slide, please. Um, so just very quickly on the procedure for getting a unitary patent, everything up to the grant process will be exactly the same as a, a conventional European patent application that you're used to. Um, the good news is you'll still be able to use all your usual European council. Um, the difference is once you get to grant, there is a one month deadline to request unitary effect. This is a very tight deadline. Normally we get three months from grants to, to complete the validations, but it's only one month for unitary effect. And obviously that will have um, a consequence for whether you, for what countries you might want to do validations. So effectively it's bringing the whole decision-making process through earlier. Um, in terms of timing, any application that's pending at the uh, go live date could become a, a unitary patent. So we're going to be receiving notice of allowances fairly soon that could ultimately become unitary patents. And potentially as of right now, it could be that there could be steps taken to delay pending applications if you want the unitary patent to be an option for them. Um, a key point that I'd like to make here is that the unitary patent system is not intended to replace the existing European patent system, but it's intended to provide more choice and flexibility and just to give applicants another option. Next slide, please. Um, given what I've said that this is a post-grant change, it's, it shouldn't surprise you that the, the pre-grant fees are not going to change and there's no legal provision for the EPO to bring in an official registration or validation fee for the, the unitary patent. Um, so potentially once you look at your European validation costs, a unitary patent could be a lot cheaper, um, but it's gonna depend on the number of countries in which you normally validate in and their translation requirements. Next slide, please. Um, so just a really quick uh, visual on this. Obviously one of the cost considerations for European patents and, and the validation of those will be your renewal costs. So in this graph, um, you can see the costs for uh, a unitary patent annual uh, renewal cost in blue. Um, and that shows you the cost in all your member states. And that's obviously a lot cheaper than what it would cost you to renew if you validated individually in all of those 17 countries, which is the, um, the line that's coming up in very dark blue on the right hand side. In practice, very few applicants would do that under the current system. They usually just validate in a small number of key countries. So really, uh, we think the balance point is going to be about four countries. And that's talking in the round. So including renewal fees and local attorney and translation costs. Um, if you're interested in costs and things, we do have a cost calculator in the firm. So feel free to contact me offline and I'm happy to go into that in more detail. Next slide, please. Um, so this traditional system and the opt out, obviously, the aim of the system is to bring everything eventually under the jurisdiction of the unitary patent court. But there were some concerns with the new court that um, decisions might not be entirely predictable, um, perhaps their quality might not be so good. Uh, so that's why this transitional seven year period has been brought in during which time applicants can opt their patents out of the jurisdiction of the court. Um, 
if you opt your patent out, you're opting it out for its entire life. So there's a seven year period in which to file your opt out, but the opt out is for the life of the patent. There is, however, the option to withdraw your opt out so you can opt back in. So you, you could opt out, wait to see how the court does and opt back in. There are some caveats to this, which um, your decisions might be limited if uh, infringement proceedings begin in other countries uh, in who fall within the jurisdiction of the court. Um, but I'm not going to go into that in detail now because it's going to get complicated and I'll go way over time. Next slide, please. Um, so during the seven year transitional period, uh, this is just quite a useful infographic of how you might want to go about getting European uh, patent protection. If you don't want to use the European Patent Office, you can do national phase filings, which will give you national rights under the jurisdiction of national courts. Uh, if you do use the European Patent Office, um, you could say, I don't want a unitary patent. I'm going to do traditional validations and I'm going to opt them out of the, the UPC absolutely fine. Alternatively, you could take your unitary patent, um, but it will fall under the, the jurisdiction of the UPC at that point. Next slide, please. Um, so we've got the sunrise period starting uh, three to four months before the, the system goes live. And we're expecting this to be triggered by Germany ratifying, and that will be uh, 1st of December, we're expecting. Once that happens, we will know exactly what the go live is, what the go live data will be. Opt outs can be filed. Um, one point to note is this doesn't just apply to applications that are pending or still to come through the system, potentially currently existing, already granted European patents that are validated in countries um, within the system will fall under the jurisdiction of the court. So you might want to think about opting out um, existing European patents. Um, we can also start filing requests for unitary effect, and the EPO has brought in a new period, a, a new procedure during the sunrise period to allow applicants to defer grant in order to make sure they can get unitary effect if that's what they want, um, which is not a system that we've had previously. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is just the timeline that I showed you earlier, um, and I've added one extra thing, which is the four month period set in the EPO's notice of allowance, so the rule 71.3 communication. If that notice of allowance issues after German ratification, um, you can get your unitary patent, probably using the EPO deferred grant option. Uh, if it doesn't, so for example, if your notice of allowance has issued now or it's already issued and you want a unitary patent, let your European Council know because we can take action to delay the deadline for responding to that notice of allowance. Um, and so and one thing to note is that as soon as you approve the text for grant in response to that notice of allowance, if you do that before the system has gone live, you remove the option for the unitary patent. Um, so take so the takeaway from the slide is while we think there's some certainty with the timing, it's not entirely decided yet. There could be some quick decisions coming up um, as things develop. So it's a good idea to start thinking about whether you might want unitary patents, whether you might want to file opt-outs and to start doing that now. Uh, next slide. And that's all from me. Um, as I said, that's my email address. I'll try to answer any questions if we've got time during the session, but if not, do feel free to contact me directly. Thank you. Thanks so much, Helen. Uh, so just one note to the audience, we are going to hold all questions until the end, just so we can get through everyone's presentations. And then, like I said before, uh, if we don't get to those, we will follow up with you afterwards. So now I am actually going to hand it over to, uh, to David to share his slides because he has some animations that he wants to make sure you all get the full effect on. So um, I'll introduce him as he's starting to share. Um, David is the founder and CEO of Licensar, a worldwide bridge builder between techno Latinos with global business decision makers to overclock untapped Latin M inventions. His mission is to transform the Latin American innovation scene using state-of-the-art legal technologies to effectuate the successful valuation and monetization of intangible assets and intellectual property. David holds a BS in biomedical engineering, 
from in Colombia, and then an LLM in patent law from Israel. Uh, he has been awarded as AI, sorry, IAM Strategy 300 2021 by IAM Magazine and Top Emerging Legal Player 2022 by the Guerrilla Conference. So David, I'll hand it over to you to talk about all the great things going on in Latin America. You are still muted. There you go. So let me share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> Can you see now? Yes, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, the Kentucky Intellectual Property Alliance and also the Ohio Intellectual Property Alliance. I'm very happy to discuss with you and share our, our um, works that we are doing in, in, in Licenciarte in Spanish, Licensed Art in, in English, and how the Latin American can be uh, um, a, a good um, um, a space for intellectual property, uh, how Latin American inventions can be a good options to companies uh, worldwide to increase the, not only the innovation, but also the diversity in innovation. So uh, let me share uh, these two points in this uh, presentation. Well, first of all, Licenciarte, uh, our goal is to overclock the inventions uh, to innovation process the invention to innovation uh, process, the diving into social networks. So we started to support Latin American uh, inventors, universities, but now we are trying to uh, help uh, other universities, companies and startups worldwide, uh, starting in Canada and in, in US. So Licenciarte is, an, uh, is the smart platform to over accelerate invention readiness to market. So we are working not only the intellectual property uh, for innovation, we combine the knowledge of uh, the engineering and technology that we need to um, create these new um, products, but also the, uh, with a generation of the crowd knowledge or the wisdom of the crowd, sorry, the reason of the crowd, we uh, can over accelerate the product market fit that any invention needs to get uh, in order to introduce to the market. So the first thing that I want to share with you is opportunities from global ecosystem from Latin American innovators. And first of all, I want to share the story of Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson uh, in, in the 80s, we are talking about MTV, the, the music uh, TV channel. In the 80s at the beginning, 99% of the, of the videos was just for, for white people. The, uh, the user always say, why don't you have people uh, in, with a uh, black skin. And they say it be because uh, we, don't, we don't see a uh, person uh, or, or singers that are uh, very good to be in our channel. After Michael Jackson um, uh, uh, show to the world the song Billie Jean and the video Billie Jean, and the rest was story. He breaks, he over the, the door, to all black singer to be in the, in the music industry and the new video uh, music industry. So NTV found the innovation in diversity with Michael Jackson. Almost 40 years after uh, Dr. Andres Jaramillo was awarded as the best inventor from the Colombian Ministry of Science with his technology, send SARS. It was a portable device to detect the SARS-CoV-2 in just 10 minutes. 
I'm not saying that Andres uh, can be the Michael Jackson of science, but who knows? Andres is uh, the director of Omic Institutes in Universidad Javeriana in Colombia, but also is a scientist in uh, California Institute of Technology. As Andres, we have a, a couple of brilliant in, uh, researchers and scientists working in Latin America, uh, working with uh, his purse or her purse in a most uh, in the top universities around the world. So we in Latin America have the capacity to create new innovation, new invention, a patented, but we don't have the money to uh, go to further technology and commercial stages. So we would like to uh, uh, focus on the concept of diversity and innovation that maybe are you familiar? This is a hot trend in the innovation uh, ecosystem. First, I'd like to stress in minorities in inventorship. And I would like to show why Latin American inventors are a minority. This is a chart. This is a chart that shows the Latin American um, percentage in patents uh, that came from PCT for international application uh, process to US. So just 1% of the inventorship in that patents uh, for a total of 480,000 patents in the last 10 years are uh, invented or have at least one inventor from Latin America. So we can say that in the inventorship, uh, Latin American inventors are a minority. So if you would like to support uh, the diversity in innovation and find new markets, new way to improve your products or the net blockbuster, uh, you can find uh, the, diverse, uh, the, the, the innovation in the diversity as NTV did in a minority uh, in Michael Jackson in that era. But other interesting point, not only the minorities in inventorship uh, can be analyzed here. Also, uh, strategies uh, in diversity, equity, and innovation can be beyond the company walls. What I'm trying to say, uh, we did a, a research uh, and we launched um, a book. Right now, this is in Spanish, but we we'll like to translate in English. It's, it's called Bical. In Bical, we found that uh, around 100 top universities and research institutions in Latin America uh, have uh, nearly 7,000 top inventions. Uh, sorry, <laughs> my cat, what are you? 7,000 top invention uh, ranked and valued for a, with a, a software that is called Patsna uh, and have a, a big valuation, very good valuation. And if, we, and if we combine this valuation that the software uh, from artificial intelligence gave us, uh, we can say that our portfolio of the top universities and the patents can be valued as $500 million. This is a, a near number of the valuation of uh, University of Washington, that is one of the top universities in the US, but they have around 1,300 patents and we have 7,000 patents. What it means that we have a very good inventions, but maybe the strategy is not the good to go to international market. Uh, beyond that invention, we have a, a lot of universities and research centers that are working in new patents, but only uh, 
get protection or ask protection in the home countries. So you can imagine if you uh, also hire uh, techno Latinos, as we call, and create new patents, but also if you license patents from uh, techno Latinos uh, that are doing a very good innovations uh, to the world. So a report uh, from the, um, that is called Latin American Riding the Technology Tsunami uh, said in, 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 in 2017 that the untapped potential is clearly huge. So Origin spent almost $28 billion in uh, research and development every year and hired hundreds of thousands of researchers. What will happen if we change the mindset and inspire these scientists and engineers to create startups and connect with entrepreneurs? I don't know if you're familiar, the last year, uh, the region that uh, most increased in investment uh, for a startup was Latin America. So right now with uh, the recession that we, uh, we are facing, uh, the change are uh, the things are changing a little bit and I would like to show uh, a different perspective. Well, um, for support these uh, companies, uh, startups, um, governments that would like to increase the diversity in innovation with a different view, uh, we uh, sign it the, um, the pledge, the pledge, the increase in diversity and innovation as a supporter, trying to uh, create a new framework showing that the diversity you can find also beyond your walls, beyond the walls of the companies license, licensing patents from innovators that they don't have or they they haven't had the opportunity to pitch the, the, the new solution that never seen from the market. Uh, and this is our, our, our role, uh, first role of licenciarte. Now we wa I want to stress the opportunities for global innovators into the Latin ecosystem. That is also a big opportunity. And this is a recent, um, uh, a trending topic that uh, we saw just 50 days ago uh, in the big battle between Edison and Apple for um, the, the patent infringement and patent license for the uh, essential um, for essential patent that Edison has for technology 5G. Uh, Colombia was the first country to uh, determine a preliminary injunction uh, banning Apple uh, or uh, Apple to import and sell uh, the iPhone for the high quality. Uh, I mean the Apple, the, the the iPhones, iPhone 12, iPhone 13 that has the 5G technology. And the, the, the judge says that Apple was banned to import, to sell uh, products in, in Colombia and an anti-anti-suit uh, determination too. That means they cannot try to reverse this uh, uh, preliminary injection in other countries and ask for the Apple that this is, I think, one of the most important uh, issues that says that says in social networks, uh, in promotions, that uh, to the user, the iPhone user, that they are not allowed to sell this kind of cell phones. And, and why yeah. is so important? Oh, sorry, so I was just gonna say two about two minutes left to wrap up. Sorry. Okay, thank you. And why is so important this uh, case? if only um, the Apple market in Colombia is less than 0.2%. It's important because 
Colombia is sending a message that if you would like to enter in Latin American market or even worldwide, Colombia is respectful of the patent right and the patent enforcement. And it's very quickly to do these informants in, in, in favor to the patent uh, holders. So Apple is worried because as Colombia was the first country, uh, the next step can be Brazil to get this decision. And Brazil is a huge market in Latin America and also can push other countries to uh, uh, say the same uh, verdict. It was so in, impactful to me to see the Colombian in the, in the big news and in the big head uh, in all newspaper that I recently launched my TikTok uh, account uh, right now in Spanish, uh, El de las Patentes, uh, talking about this um, um, uh, verdict, but also uh, trying to uh, explain to startups and inventors the importance of the intellectual property and the patents. Uh, just to finish uh, a final thought. So the uh, World Wide Web 3 can be a huge opportunity to democrat democratize the innovations for, uh, for the techno Latinos because these kind of new technologies can increase the visibility and facilitate the negotiation between uh, uh, parties. So blockchain, uh, metaverse, it will be a huge opportunity. Also new ways to license can be important to uh, 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 for, for in, have this kind of uh, licensing uh, from the Latinos to worldwide, uh, for example, patent pools, if we can gather, gather all the technologies from Latin America and different fields, uh, we can have uh, more power in order to negotiate. And the last point that I stressed before, Colombia is becoming a patent hub. After this decision, the assumption is that uh, we will have more um, um, a, increase in patent inside Colombia and the possibility to enforce the, 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 the patent rights easier and faster than in other countries. So if you would like to, to know more about uh, our work, uh, I am happy to invite you to the uh, next less uh, uh, conference. I will discuss about Latin American invention, the intrepid potential is clearly huge. And thank you very much. I'm happy to uh, answer uh, your questions at the end of the session. Thanks so much, David. So we are going to, let me just reshare mine really quickly. Can you all see my slides okay? Or my screen? Yeah. And now my cat is, is outside the door. <laughs> Sorry if you couldn't hear it. Um, okay, so next we have uh, Shinmin Ying with uh, beyond attorneys at law. So we're going to kind of get more into uh, filing for IP protection in China. In China sorry. Um, Xinmin is a patent attorney and judicial appraiser in China and registered U.S. patent attorney. She received her PhD in cancer biology from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center at Beyond Attorneys at Law. Xinmin is in charge of the New York representative office. She's responsible for consulting overseas and domestic clients. She's released numerous articles in professional publications regarding intellectual property, biology, chemistry, medicine, and life sciences, and has spoken at many domestic forums and lectured overseas at various events. So I will pass it off to you, Shinmin, to discuss more about China's patent system. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Carly, can I uh, share the screen by myself? Uh, yes, if you, yeah, if you have tr uh, transitions you want to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, okay, yeah. So how about now, can everybody see? 
Yes. Okay. And so the firm called the BR Attorney at Law is a Chinese firm. We have a New York office here. So everybody, if you have any issues about the China IP law, anything, so you can send us email, whatever. Yeah, call me. Uh, I will talk about the patent system in China today. So the patent persecution in China. So first, it's first filing system. So it's absolute novelty. There is no one year grants period like US. We also have no requirements for IDS declaration, no ICE, no CPA, no continuation, no CIP, no reissue application. But the division application is available. Uh, no patent, a uh, plant patent, but the patent variety available for new plant variety. Um, for reject app application, you request a re examination. That's different meanings for re examination in US. Um, so anyone uh, can request uh, uh, invalidation before Chinese Patent Office anytime. There's no time window in China for invalidation. And if the invention related to the genetic resource, the disclosure of information is required. There is no best mode requirement in China. And for invention made in China, firm filing license is required. So for PCT application, it basically is the same, but the very unique uh, practice in China is translation is required for filing. So if you cannot prepare the, the uh, translation in time within 30 months deadline, you have two months extension for preparing the translations. So the tips are here is there's no request uh, for two months extension. You just pay the money when you're ready. And the Chinese translation is required in China. And the, the last one is all the actual claim fee are calculated based on the original publication of a PCT. So in China, 10 claims are free. So each uh, actual claim will be uh, charged $25. And if you want to amend the claims, reduce the number, try to avoid the actual claim if it, it doesn't work. And the errors you want to, um, you made, you want to uh, correct actually it almost uh, you can do any time for PCT application. Um, but if you choose in parents convention entrance translation uh, errors cannot be fixed because the priority document has no legal effect in China. So give a, a Chinese associate enough time to prepare the high quality translation, especially if you want to for the Chinese application through parents convention. So the next topic is about the utility model patents. This is very unique in China. We have three patents, type patents. One is invention, utility, and the design patents. So utility model patents are the technical solution relating to shape, to structure, or their combination of the product. The protection term is 10 years from the filing date. Not allowable subject matter for utility model patents are process claims or the chemicals or the like. So those are not patentable for utility model patents in China. Um, the examination is kind of a between the formality check and the you know, substantive check. So those are the issues I list here for um, you know, examination for utility model. So the advantage of utility model patents is quick, you know, takes six to 12 months to get the patents. And it's a simple procedure because there is no substantive examination. Um, it's a lower cost because there's a mostly, there's a no office action. And it's easier to face the invalidation challenge because only one or two prior arts in the same technology area 
can be combined to challenge the inventive step of the utility model patterns. Um, it's the kind of a same protection to invention patterns. But one thing you need to know, if you want to enforce your utility model patent, you need to get the evaluation report from China Patent Office. Then you can file the lawsuit and or you know, file the complaints. So the tips here is you can use utility model patterns to form network of protection for important technology, like you file several together covering the product invention patterns and the utility model patterns. And for some short-term protection concern, you, you can also using the, you can use the utility model patterns for invention, for short-term protection. Um, and also for if you made a small modification in the structure or the shape or whatever, so you can find the utility model patterns for that one. And this one also can combine, go back to the first one. Um, please remember, it's not impossible to branch out a utility model application from invention application. So that means you cannot change the uh, you know, application type in China. Um, and, uh, you know, but uh, invention patent or your utility model, they can claim each other as a priority. And um, so the changing type of application is not allowed during persecution in China. So here also uh, consider about the divisional. So if you file divisional in China, if the parent application is invention, so the division must be invention. You cannot find a, a divisional based on the invention as a utility model. Double patenting is the exceptional here. Uh, you can find both utility model and the invention patent application for same invention at the same time. So this is a, a useful strategy for product with long technology lifetime and the high inventive, uh, inventive step. Last part, foreign filing license. So for invention made in China, you need to get a foreign filing license to do the foreign filing. And this provision doesn't apply to designs, only to, uh, apply to invention or utility model patent. And that this provision apply to anyone, including you know foreign entity or individual, and it also applies to later foreign filing a uh, invention, which is the first file in China. So you file in China first. If you want to do the foreign filing, you still need to get the foreign filing license to do. So invention made in China. This is the keyword for foreign filing license. So that means that the substantive contents of the invention was complete in China. But if you like use the CIO to do some contract work, whatever, it doesn't count. So here is the uh, procedure, uh, the, the, the way you can get a foreign filing license. Uh, for example, you can do the direct foreign filing in China if the invention made in China. It doesn't require you do the Chinese application filing first. You can do foreign filing, but you need to get a foreign filing license. It takes four to six months to get it. And also Chinese version of the specification need to submit to the patent office. But if you do file the China patent or a uh, China patent uh, application first, so you it takes only two to four weeks to get a foreign filing. It's much easier. That's why a lot of uh, company, foreign company, choose this way to do the you know the filings strategy to do the filings. If you file the PCT application uh, first. So there is no request needed for foreign filing. The foreign filing license will be um, issued automatically. So here is the things you need to do for the foreign filing. And the difference between US and China for foreign filing, 
the most important part is the license cannot be attained retroactively in China, but the, it's much uh, flexible in US. So the tips for US client here is calculate the possible delay for getting the license if you want to do the direct firm filing. And um, you know it's available to do firm filing first in for invention made in China. And the foreign filing license cannot be obtained retroactively in China. Yeah, that's all. I hope I didn't uh, <laughs> get too long to finish my talk. Yep, that was perfect. Thank you so much, Shinmin. So next um, uh, and last but not least, we have Hunter Wang, also of Beyond Attorneys at Law. Hunter is a partner at the New York office. Uh, his practice focuses on all aspects of China trademark law and extends to copyright, domain name, unfair competition, and other IP related laws. With over 20 years experience, Hunter has successfully represented both Chinese and foreign clients in protecting their brands worldwide. Since moving to New York in 2007, he mainly provides strategic advice to foreign clients in IP prosecution, enforcement, and litigation in China. So Hunter, I'll hand it over to you to discuss more about trademark protection in China. Okay, one second. Is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'd like to share with you trademark protection in China as the time allocated to each of us is very limited. I'll go through my slides very quickly. My presentation will focus on trademark filing system, common issues faced by foreign applicants and bad faith filings in China. China adopts the first to file uh, principle. No use is required unless a non-use translation is filed by a third party after the registration. China uses a NIS classification, but under each class, there are a few subclasses. Protection scope is based on subclasses. So when filing the application, you are suggested to cover more subclasses. According to the law, the applied trademark should be distinctive. Uh, generic and descriptive marks are not allowed. Suggestive marks are okay, uh, but uh, as you know, the line between a suggestive mark and a descript uh, descriptive mark is often blurry. For 3D design marks, they should be non-functional. Here are two examples. The first one was refused and the second, uh, the second one successfully registered. For trademarks uh, using standard characters, the basic rule is, uh, for, is a minimum of three letters. And uh, if your trademark uh, is refused uh, because lack of uh, distinctiveness and uh, you can uh, make your trademarks uh, distinctive by stylizing characters, uh, adding distinctive design or colors, et cetera. It is possible for a trademark to acquire distinctiveness through use in China. The first one failed to register and the second one was success successfully registered. For a non-Chinese trademark, a Chinese equivalent is not mandatory. And uh, we usually use uh, translation, transliteration, or combination of the both to create uh, a Chinese equivalent. If you only manufacture products in China but not sell them, you would better register your trademark in China. If it's registered by, another, by other parties and your use of the mark on the products may constitute infringement.
if you have registered your trademark uh, but not sell products in China, you are suggested to refile new application for it every two to three years to avoid non-use cancellation. Bad face filing is always a headache for famous trademark owners in China. Uh, trademark squatters always copy or imitate famous trademarks. Here are examples of Adidas. And also famous trademarks uh, are also registered on related but not uh, similar goods or services. For example, if you have a famous trademark in class 25 and the trademark squatters may register them in class 18, class 14, class 3, et cetera. China has taken a series of actions to crack down bad face filings, including the amendment of China trademark law, which was implemented in 2019. It mainly targets malicious applications uh, uh, with no intention to use. Authentic trademark owners may file opposition, invalidation, or non-use cancellation against uh, bad face filings. But uh, the most efficient way is to file defensive applications for their own trademarks as soon as possible. For famous trademark owners, they may file requests for the recognition in relevant cases because a famous trademark can enjoy cross-class protection. Trademark owners may take actions based on, on the following legal grounds. And uh, when you take uh, actions, uh, you may collect uh, evidence to prove uh, the applicant uh, is your agent or representative, uh, the application was filed without your authorization, or the applicant has a contract, uh, contract business or other relationship with you, and also the application infringes your existing prior rights, uh, trade name, copyright, etc. If a famous trademark has been registered in China, it may enjoy cross-class protection. Otherwise, it may only be protected on similar goods and services. Honesty and credibility is one of the general principles for China civil law, and it is, of course, the basic provision for trademark law. To fully protect your brands in China, build up a great wall for them first. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Hunter. So now we will go into kind of Q&A area. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes left in our scheduled time. Uh, I did just want to say a big thank you to all of our presenters again. Um, this is great, uh, great information for all of our community. Um, so first, I see one for Helen. Um, are there any limitations with creating field of use license agreements that designate particular countries, even though the unitary patent must be assigned as a whole? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, you're absolutely fine to divide your license up country by country as as you, uh, you know, per your preferences. Um, there might be some complications in terms of how things might be enforced and the way the regional, um, the sort of the uh, yeah regional and local divisions of the the unitary patent court work. Um, but that would probably be a much longer and more complicated uh, conversation. But essentially, you can license country by country and it'll be fine. Um, but there might be some things to think about in terms of how you word some of those agreements. Okay, thanks, Helen. I think, um, and everyone, just a reminder, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat or raise your hand and we can unmute you if you'd like to ask them um, rather than typing them out. Uh, the next one I see is also for Helen. Um, 
can an applicant slash patentee opt out before the sunrise period for the UP, UPC begins or must they wait until sunrise begins? Um, we'll need to wait until sunrise begins, um, but it's good to start making those decisions now. We're expecting um, quite a big rush of opt outs to be filed once the sunrise period starts. It is possible to do them in bulk, so it so sort of multiple patents can be be opted out in bundles. Um, so yeah, definitely start thinking about it and start engaging with your European Council so that they can be primed and ready to go. Okay, thanks, Helen. And I think this is a question kind of for everybody. So if, if anyone wants to chime in. Um, so Monique asks, tell me more about the advantages of US businesses diversifying business into international markets. You all do this work consistently. So interested in hearing your perspectives. No takers. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think from a European perspective is it's there are big markets out there. And I think that applies to a lot of the other countries and a lot of the other regions that we've been talking about. And there are good opportunities um, from my perspective in terms of uh, protecting inventions at the EPO, one of the interesting things that I've noticed, and this is going to be very specific to my practice, which is life sciences, but I'm seeing increasing emphasis on the importance of diagnostics and particularly personalized diagnostics for personalized medicine and so on. And obviously uh, in the US with the, the case law that we've had in the last few years, that's quite a tricky area now to get patent protection. Um, we don't have those same problems at the EPO. We have very clearly established case law in terms of, um, you, you know, in that particular space. And it, it's much more straightforward to try and get patent protection for these things. So it's partly it's access to additional markets and so on, which can be really beneficial. But it's also thinking about creative IP strategies and opportunities potentially to protect things in different ways in different countries and to take advantage of the differences in in the international practice that we see, I would say. I'd be interested to know what um, some of the other, other panelists have to think on that one. Yeah, I I talk a little bit. <laughs> I talk a little bit about the China, Chinese market. So of course, China have a, you know, 15 billion, uh, million, uh, 1.5 billion people. <laughs> it's a huge market. Yeah. So, um, but I found a lot of issues for, uh, you know, US company uh, try to do business in China. So some of, the, of them cannot protect them, uh, you know, uh, very well. So like they make, uh, 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 you know, choose the manufacturer in China and work with the uh, partner. And they didn't uh, uh, register their mark, didn't uh, you know apply the patents cover their product, and finally you know uh, you know relationship broke up, and uh, the Chinese company actually uh, registered the mark and uh, uh, get the design patents or whatever, and they can get big troubles. They have to do a lot of you know actions to. Uh, cancel the trademark, to invalidate the trademark, to invalidation the, the patents. If they don't do that, so they, they will cannot get into Chinese market anymore. So that's actually give us a lesson. If you want to do business in China, first of all, protect yourself very well and uh, register trademark, uh, uh, file the application covering the product and uh, especially, you know, make the agreement in details with the Chinese partners. So those are very important point taken for the US company. David, did you have something to add? Yes, uh, uh, thank you uh, for our panelists. I learned a lot about uh, Europe, Asia, 
and different ways to protect intellectual property that I think Latin America needs to learn. I just want to add uh, two points. First, uh, one that I forgot to tell you, uh, we are living in, uh, in, in amazing uh, days, <coughs> somebody is saying. Um, we are, uh, have some um, limitations for in the importation of raw materials and, and foods for the uh, Ukrainian and Russia war, um, also for the pandemic, and we are also live in this kind of, of issues. So in Colombia, for instance, the new government that will begin in a few days, they would like to increase the, the national production for some um, uh, foods and raw materials that before we imported, for instance, from Russia. Uh, so I think it will be a very good opportunity for patent holders uh, in developed markets trying not to uh, sell the products in Colombia or in Latin America, instead of that, trying to license the, the patents to uh, the national or the local uh, uh, manufacturer and create a um, small uh, capacities to produce uh, local uh, productions. So this uh, phenomenon is called from the globalizations to globalizations. That it means trying to create the products in each country. I think it will be a trend in the next few years for the limitation for importation that we will have uh, recently. And the second point that I want to highlight is uh, for sure, we need to increase in Latin America our, our base of clients or users. In all Latin America, we are uh, roughly 600 million people, but we have uh, various countries we, that we don't have this kind of uh, European, uh, the European patent office. And I think, I believe that a unitary patent for instance, we cannot say for all Latin America because I think it's quite difficult, but Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, uh, and Peru, we are in the same com uh, Andean community and we have the same patent law, but every country uh, manage his in its intellectual property. I think we can create a unitary patent between these a community and a Nian community uh, in order to increase the, uh, the market for patent holders. If they patent in one of those countries, they can have these patent protections in, in, in all the countries. In addition, I also, uh, in my master thesis, I, I worked about uh, the utility model and how we can improve this important uh, uh, patent protection for incremental uh, innovation. And I, 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 I always like the, the utility model approach that China has, where is a, a tool that an SME can uh, file easily and have a protections uh, for, uh, the, the, for his invention. In Colombia, we have a, a, a utility model, as I taught, uh, for the community and uh, Andinian community. It's the same utility model, but it is like a, a patent and a small patent. And always the law firm says, try to reach the uh, patent invention, as we call it. And if you don't get it, you can get the utility model, but the prices are almost the same. So we need to improve the, the, the law uh, to support or to bust the utility model as, a, as the best tool for SME and for incremental invention. I think this, is, this will be the next steps that maybe we can do in 
10 years, 20 years in Latin America in order to become a, a, a leader in intellectual property and the companies would like to uh, file more patents in our country as well as uh, the inventors in, in the local uh, comp in the local countries would like to believe more in the in the intellectual property uh, uh, rights. Thanks, David, for that insight. Okay, I think we have just a couple more questions. So one from Mary, what resources can our Kentucky businesses turn to for basic information on learning patent protection? And I think I can answer that one. And then if you all have anything to add, you can feel free to hop in. Um, Kippa has a great connection with the Midwest region USPTO office. So we can connect you all there, Mary. Um, and then just as far as just kind of basics go, uh, USPTO and WIFO offer some really great resources um, online. For, for access for free. Um, and then of course, Kippa, we offer uh, monthly webinars that kind of we've ranged from the basics up to more of what we're discussing today. So Mary, if you wanna reach out to me via email, um, I, can, I can connect you further there with some more resources. Um, and then the next one I see is from Monique. So uh, the USIPA and its affiliates are becoming more intentional about sharing how to become a professional working in innovation. As respected experts in innovation or IP, uh, would you have advice to share to students or others interested in starting a career in international IP or innovation? I would say networks is a really good starting point. There are some really great ones. Um, so one of the ones that I belong to is AUTM, uh, which is obviously your, one of your US networks, but it's a really great place to meet people both within um, you know, the, the ecosystem in the US, but also there is a lot of international pull at the conferences um, and a lot of crossover between AUTM and, and the UK equivalent uh, or organization which is called Praxis Oral and I know we had um, quite a few people from from Kentucky over at our annual conference recently. Um, uh, I definitely saw a few familiar names on the um, participant list and I think that's you know meeting people at these sorts of um, events that are hosted by some of these networks is just a really great place to start um, finding out a bit more uh, and about what people do and what the opportunities are because there are a lot. Um, yeah, and I think Megan's just posted a, a link link to ASTP, ASTP Proton, which is the um, European equivalent as well. So, yeah, net, networks are a really great starting point, I think. Thanks, Helen. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Okay. Um, so we did have one more question, but I think um, it may be best uh, to, to answer offline. So I'll actually send it to you all um, and then get back to them via email. Um, and we do just have one minute left. So I did just want to do a quick wrap up. I uh, just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. And a big thank you to all of our presenters for joining us and to the Ohio Intellectual Property Alliance for co-hosting. Um, this has been a great informative session um, and we really appreciate all of your all's time. Um, just as a quick plug for our next event um, and save the date on August 24th, we'll be hosting our first hybrid in-person event at Zoller Pumps Center for Excellence in Louisville. Uh, there'll be a discussion on how to strategize around filing of international IP in your business and um, we'll kind of kind of dig more into into the strategy side of things when you're looking at filing for international IP so be on the lookout for the invite uh, for that in the next few weeks if you won't be able to join in person we are hoping to stream that um, so watch for both um, so just a big thanks again to everyone and I will wrap us up with that um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your Friday and great weekend. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank have you. Have a good one. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.